But the problem is, we get, as we talk about these things, is it's not a simple question. And it's not a simple problem. Because we, we basically have people saying, this is the problem, how we pretty much uh, slice it up, is I want to do stuff wherever I am, whenever I want to do it. If I'm offline, I want to do it still. If I'm online, I want to do it still. If I don't have my computer, I still want to do it. Okay? Low Earth orbit came up during the conversation, so yes. And as we always refer to it, if, if we're Amish, we're not online. And here's the challenge, and this is kind of like indirectly from the social media standpoint and from a marketing standpoint. I had a, a lunch meeting yesterday with a, a person from one of our, one of our other partners. Uh, we were talking about our marketing methodologies, and one of the things we were talking about was that everybody gets to choose how they work with all of the information. You know, I may personally think that our best marketing tool is our e-newsletter, but some people just want to see stuff on Twitter. Some people want to see blogs. Some people want to see Facebook. Some people want to see whatever. And unfortunately, the end user has so many options in terms of how to receive information, they want that flexibility. Well, the same thing's true here. We have so many people who want to be able to work remotely. I want to work from home. I want to work from home on my laptop. I want data on my mobile phone. I want blah, 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 blah. And as a provider of the IT service, and by that I mean whether you're IT staff, whether you're the company owner for a small organization, whatever, you have to decide how flexible do you want to be in terms of allowing people to do this. Okay? Now, we want to be able to satisfy all these people, and we want to cover a lot of topics here today, but here's the problem. We're talking about just an introduction to the concepts, okay? We're not gonna get uber geeky, and I guarantee you at some point, we, and if, once Kevin and Steve get here, they will as well, we will trail into the geek world. It just, it's, it's in our brains, it's just gonna happen. Wave something, throw something that doesn't harm us. Uh, let us know when we start going into that. But it's, this is just an introduction, okay? And the issue is, is that everybody is different. <coughs> Good news. Lots of ways, lots of ways to do it. <coughs> and every one of them will work, sort of, kind of, some of the time. Unfortunately, there's so many choices on how to do this, every one of them has weaknesses. Cost weakness, versatility, performance, security. Okay? Whatever solution your organization deals with, it'll be wrong under certain circumstances. Okay? And by the way, make this, this can be interactive. If you guys have any questions or comments or points, I don't care. So here's, here's how we kind of started. And where we started was somebody has a remote device. And yes, we made it a laptop, but conceivably it could be a mobile phone. It could be a tablet, it could be an iPad, it could be a droid, it could be a desktop. It can be a friend's laptop, which has very different meanings, and we'll talk about that. But we're somewhere else. And here we've got the web. And here we've got data or an application that we want to get to. So somehow, we want to basically make this move. As opposed to traditionally, I've got my device here, and I'm connecting to it. And then, okay, yeah, fine, we've got the cloud-based services. And the cloud-based services, I want to be very clear, you're still going through the web, but you've got this hosted stuff that's uh, hosted by somebody else that's not your corporate location. Here's one of the main concepts that you don't have to get the specifics, but it's critical, this is critical for you to understand, and that is speed, all right? Everybody talks about the internet and access, usually talking about it either streaming media or I'm going to visiting websites. Those are the two most common things we talk about. Well, when we talk about applications, yeah, I think we'll be right when we talk about applications, it's a different kind of need. 
and we'll get into the specifics there. But what I want to show you here is where we've got the connection. And don't worry too much about what the numbers represent because they're just, they're just numbers, but they're related to each other. So here in a traditional network connection, where a laptop or a desktop is connecting to servers, you see on today's networks usually about one billion bits, one gigabit of information past a second. Now, how many of you guys are techie geeks? Okay, thank you for not going, that's not quite true about it. Okay? <laughs> and it's not because in a lot of cases there are still organizations that have 100 megabits or one tenth the speed for their desktops, whatever. But for a new network, all that kind of thing, we're talking gigabit, okay? Now, the connection that that organization has, or the connection for the uh, ISP, so this is the company to the internet, if we go with a traditional T1, which small businesses, that's reasonable speed, that's 1.5 million bits per second. A little over about one and a half percent of that gigabit speed we have. And it's one pipe. So whoever's going out or coming in to or from the internet are all using that same one and a half megabit pipe. It is very, very slow by comparison. So if you have someone who is working on data here on their local laptop and they want to have the same experience here, right out of the gate we're talking 1% the speed for a traditional T1. Okay, let's say they have fiber, we're paying a lot of money for it. Well, fiber is 10, 20 megabits per second. That's still a lot less than 1,000 megabits per second. And we've still got everybody in the company that's uh, going for that resource. And plus, we're not done yet because we also have how fast is your connection to the web. So here, for example, I think they've got a DSL. So it's a wireless connection connected to a DSL, and the DSL is less than one megabit per second. So I've got my connection here at less than 1% of what my normal connection is. Then I'm connected through the cloud, and this is not a straight shot. This is going through any number of servers and services and all that kind of thing. The key thing I want you to come away with is that this experience, this local experience for the corporation, is by literally factors of 10 to 100 small or slower than this configuration from a remote laptop to the server, okay? Now, are there ways to improve that? Yes, tons of them, all right? But they all get around this issue, okay? Did everybody get this one point? Okay. So we're going to break this down into two, con into two types of connections. First of all is documents. I want my Word. I want my Excel. Now, we're being real simple here as we're just talking about Word documents. We're not talking like Excel documents that automatically open up a SQL connection, load data here, blah, 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 blah. No. Those are applications as far as I'm concerned. So this is your traditional I'm working on documents. That's it. And the documents start out stored at the corporate location. Applications, we're talking about where the applications are stored at the corporate location for purposes here, and the data is, but you need to get to the application in order to get to the data. So you can't open up a QuickBooks data file without QuickBooks. You gotta be running QuickBooks, okay? So, and again, simplification. So, what are the goals we wanna do? And, and some of you may be sitting there going, I just want to do my work. Why is this so complicated? Well, tough. It's a free lunch. Deal with it. <laughs> but really, it comes down to the work that you're trying to do really comes down to this. I'm working on my documents. And these are kind of the three ways you can do it. And we'll go over each of these. Or I'm entering data into our applications, in which case we need to know where the data is and where the applications are. And they can either be local, they're on your computer, or they can be in the cloud, or they can be at your corporate headquarters. 
And if your data and applications are local, you're really not remotely working. You're working on your, on your computer. So it's where it's a combination of these things. It's not always local. Okay? So what do we mean by these? First of all, synchronize. Synchronize is really simple. There's more than one set of the copy of the document. So if I have a My Documents folder, I have a copy of it on my laptop, I have a copy of it on my tablet, I have a copy of it on my phone, I have a copy of it on our server, I have a copy of it on the cloud. And whenever I make changes to any of those, it automatically makes the changes everywhere else. That's cool. That's a little, I'm not going to to configure because more and more services are going to do that for you automatically. But that's an automatic way. So even if you're offline, even if you're online, all right, you can be working on your documents on your laptop that's offline, and then when you get back online, it'll automatically synchronize the changes. Okay? This works really nicely for documents. It doesn't work for applications, though. Because applications, usually you change the data and it doesn't, you know, you can't just change a piece of the data. There are exceptions to this. Some applications will do that, but for purposes of this conversation, we're not talking about those. Second is a direct connect. That's where we literally have, it will put, this laptop will pretend like it is actually connected to the home network. So it looks and behaves exactly the same way as if I was at the home network, with the exception of it will be significantly slower. Because remember the thing we talked about earlier with the connection speed. Copy. I'm just going to make a copy. We've all done this, right? Where we just, yeah, how do we synchronize data? Um, I use this. Okay, well, what do you do with it? Well, I really just use it and hope I never, ever lose it because if I do, my life is over. Okay. Or, the other one, my favorite, I'm going to email it to myself. <laughs> Which sounds a little naughty. Um, but it works. But it works. But it works. But not well. And we'll talk about why the copying thing is becoming more and more the, 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 the issue of last resort. Okay. And then for terms of local, local is where you are. Right now, locally is, and I'm actually, I'm not using their wireless network because I've, I've found that it's not the best performing in the world. So I've got my MiFi, which is a Verizon thing that allows me to connect to them. But it's still my It's my local connection here to the internet. So that's what I'm calling local. And then the cloud is, again, that spot that's between this local or this network between us, this laptop and Verizon, and then Verizon and the internet, and then the internet and Time Warner as it happens, and then Time Warner in our office, okay? And then corporate, corporate. where is the local location? And again, we're just calling it corporate at this particular point in time. Okay. okay, documents. And we kind of talked about these already, but synchronize with corp storage, offline files, direct connect, and then you have services. Now, the synchronize with corporate storage, offline files, actually is built into Windows uh, networks. Uh, offline files also is called synchronized folders where essentially there are folders that will automatically synchronize when you, when you log on and when you log off, okay? That's not to be confused with um, some of these services. Direct Connect, that would be where you're using either a VPN or some other kind of tunneling uh, that could also be point to point where you actually are connected to the network. The, the thing about this is this, you actually don't have to be connected to the internet in order to take advantage of. Ultimately, you have to that the stuff synchronizes but you don't have to be in order to access your data. This, you do. Direct connect, you do have to be connected directly. Then we have services. How many people are using, did I get Google Drive right? Is that what they do? I think it is. Uh, SkyDrive, Dropbox, Google, those are all cloud-based services. Some of them synchronize better than others. The new version of Office 365, for example, is taking advantage of Microsoft service, which is called SkyDrive. And essentially, I can identify any folder on my laptop, 
or any devices, and it will automatically synchronize on any of my devices that I'm logged on to. So, as I mentioned, I've got a tablet, I've got my phone, I've got my laptop, I've got another laptop at the office, I've got a desktop at the office. All of those automatically are synchronized. So, literally, I started this document uh, on this laptop when I was at lunch yesterday, the person I was having lunch with was late, so I was working on, I opened up the, the PowerPoint uh, on my tablet and it immediately brought up all the changes and actually told me what page I was on last. So I just kept making some changes, saved that, went back to my laptop, all the, you know, I didn't have to know where anything was. So it's becoming more and more integrated with the applications. So, and Dropbox, Google Drive, iCloud, all of those kind of things uh, have more and more of those features built in. Office 365 is essentially a collection of products, of Microsoft products, traditional on the desktop that you, you rent, you pay a monthly fee for. Um, that includes Office Professionals, so that would include all of the whole suite, including publisher, access, all that good fun stuff. When you start talking about these services, access would be the one that I'd be a little bit, a little bit concerned about how well it synchronizes, simply because it's a database and there's a lot of, a lot of deltas that go back and forth in the file while you're using it. But otherwise, yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good question. And the thing about Office 365 that works very nicely is it is completely integrated into Office 2013. So, not to make that, is our next month gonna be Office 365? So our next month is actually gonna be a much deeper dive into Office 365 the new version and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, that'll be one of the, because to me, that itself is the biggest change in Office 365. They're gonna tell you about the Office 2013 and all that, but this whole integration uh, with SkyDrive and integration in multiple devices, and they're also including, so you can have Office for Mac is included in it, all that kind of fun stuff. That's, that's the cool stuff to me, okay? Um, Amish style. Subtle opinion there. The problem with this is whatever method you, and we've all done it, we all probably continue to do it, uh, we've all done it where we simply have to get a copy of the data to our future self somehow. You know, and we do that. That's great, but if you rely on that, it's very hard to keep track of which one's the latest version, of where did I put the thumb drive, uh, you have to worry about attachment size, all that kind of stuff. It is just fraught with ways to fail, okay? And these solutions, actually, SkyDrive, Dropbox, is it, is it Google Drive? Okay, all of these guys are free. Um, but, it's a good, but it's a good point, is that one of the things you have to be worried about or be concerned about with this, with this uh, configuration is security. Because by definition, you know, if you think about it, for, again, and I'm simplifying here, if two people have a private conversation over in the corner where nobody can hear them, that is by definition more secure than two people having a conversation far apart with various levels of technology going between. Okay, now, you can say, well, what if there's a listening device? What if it? Be quiet, it's a free lunch. <laughs> but the issue is, is the more flexibility that you add in terms of how you access and how you manipulate and how you go after the data, the less secure it is. Or the more activity and cost you have to put into guarding that solution. That's it. You know, so, I mean, that, and that's not, that's not changing. So, okay. Direct connecting. I'm going to let you talk about the... All right, direct connecting. Um, this is Kevin, by the way, for the, the, those of you who haven't seen him uh, and those of you who are online. <laughs> um, John's going to yell at me if I don't speak up. Um, we have three things down here, and really there are dozens upon dozens upon hundreds of different ways of doing this. We simplify it. These are probably the most popular, the most common, the things you're going to see when you go in the average place. Um, a VPN. Um, Yes, there's stuff in the middle of a VPN, but we still like to consider it a direct connect. What it does, um, we're here in Hattie's, our office is down the street um, over by Georgetown, and uh, a VPN would allow my computer to think it's actually over there in the office, virtual private network. So I can do anything, I can access, if I did something on my laptop, 
it thinks I'm at the network, so I have uh, complete access to the computer or the servers there, any other resources I have there. The trade-off, like Bob was mentioning with the internet connections, I'm running at some fraction of uh, the speed that I would be if I was there. In some cases, it doesn't matter. Copy a little tiny Word document over, you won't notice. If you're trying to pull you know, a massive image file, you're going to sit there for a while while it copies. There's unfortunately no way around that. Uh, VPNs can get as complicated or as simple as you want, um, and likewise the cost can be as little uh, as free. It can be extremely expensive uh, for some of the high-end enterprise level, your Cisco VPN concentrators, all that really fancy, I can make up a lot of acronyms and I don't even know the difference. Um, so it's, it works. You just have to look at it if it's going to be appropriate for whatever type of uh, information you're going to be pulling or accessing. Right. Now, a lot of cases, the VPNs have actually been around for well over a decade. But they used to be incredibly expensive, incredibly unreliable, uh, and a real pain in the tuchus to configure. Tuchus is a technical term. Mm -hmm. We're now on tuchus 3.0. <laughs> The nice thing now is that in a lot of cases, the router, which is one of the devices that stands between your corporate organization and your internet, a lot of cases now, the router actually includes VPN connectivity as a built-in feature. And there's additional licensing, configuration, all that kind of stuff involved, but it's, it's there and it, and, it, and it works pretty solid, usually. One of the nicer things about uh, VPN, generally speaking, they are more of a secure connection so if you're dealing with your HIPAA compliance or any kind of thing that requires a certain level of security, VPNs are typically the way you go. Uh, they create the encrypted tunnel between you and wherever you're trying to connect to. And it is more difficult, not impossible, more difficult to break into any of the in the middle conversation. Next one. Uh, next one is RDS. Oh. RDS, yay, more acronyms. Uh, remote desktop services, previously known as terminal services for those who have been around for a while. Um, what this does is, again, I'll use the analogy of, okay, we have Bob's laptop here. I can type on it, I see a screen. RDS, what that does is it gives you a screen on another machine. So all the processing is done on some remote computer, be it a workstation, a server, something like that. You are actually just accessing the screen on that remote computer. The benefit is all the processing power is done wherever you're connecting to. So if I had a RDS server in the office, I'd log into it, and I'm doing all my work in the office. Everything is working exactly like I would be in the office, and I see a projected image of what I'm doing over there. The trade-off, or the, the, the benefit is, again, everything is nice and fast. The trade-off is things like printing become an issue, uh, security can be a bit more of an issue, file transfer between is more of an issue, um, and there is licensing fees associated with it. Uh, it does work, um, but again, it's a, you have to understand what you're trying to do uh, before you commit to any one of them. So to give an example, to use Kevin's example, he was talking about opening up a file. So if I want to open up a 5 meg file, image file to, to play with, in a VPN situation, if that file is located here on the server, I am going to have to download to this machine 5 megabytes worth of information, which as we talked about, there are speed issues, all that good fun stuff. Once I do that, it's actually located on the machine we're working on. Okay? In a, in a remote desktop situation, we actually on here, I have a remote control to this laptop here. And when I open the file, it actually, all that stuff happens over here. I just see the results, and I can play with it. At the end of it, though, I do not have that file located on the laptop. And you can't print it. You... It depends <laughs> on how you configure it and all that. There are ways it gets complicated. And how much you get on both. Right. It's doable, yes more configuration and maybe cost in the form of money or just time to do it. Yep. And it's common to see a combination of the VPN, so, uh, a VPN and RDS, where the VPN creates that secure tunnel and then you use that tunnel to connect to a, a, a desktop at the office. Okay? 
Now, one other thing just to throw in here to make it even more complicated is you might hear the terminal server term or remote desktop server. Instead of having a physical server at your corporate office, you can actually have a server that is pretending to be many desktops simultaneously and that many people are connecting to, which is a great way to do that but you need to make sure there's expense of the server, the licensing. You also need to make sure that that pipe that goes through the internet to your location has the bandwidth to take 20, 30, 40 people, all that. So, but that's, that's definitely <coughs> doable as well. And another uh, product you usually hear associated with this is called Citrix. Um, if some people have ever dealt with that uh, Citrix server of any kind, it does the same stuff. It's yep. just their brand. Different tool. Yeah. And what's the RDP you had on your other slide as another acronym for this? Remote Desktop Protocol. That's the actual what's talking. RDS, Remote Desktop Services, this is what answers. So you use an RDP client and they're available for Mac, Linux, Windows, everything. Uh, even Android devices, iOS devices, Windows Phone, they all have an RDP client. And then RDS answers to it. Um, it's called more or less the same thing on a desktop. You can answer a Citrix, they have their own version of it. So. What do you do if R2D2 responds? <laughs> <laughs> then you paint him in very bright colors and call him Artie Deco. <laughs> okay. This is something that, in, that is used by a lot of people where an individual wants to get this remote connection, but there's no overall IT service available to do it. And that's where we're going to use a, a third party package that allow us to do it. There's good points and there's bad points. Um, these, are, these are four uh, examples. Log me in, go to my PC, Team Viewer, PC Anywhere. By and large, what you do is you install the piece of software on the computer that you want to run remotely, so the computer back at the corporate office, and then using either a web interface or an application installed here, you connect to that. And it's very similar to the remote desktop service or, or terminal server, but you use that. Now, if you're thinking about this from an IT director, man, that scares you. Because now you've got these people who are installing software, you don't know who, you don't know why, you don't know whose credentials are being used, they're not the most efficient communication methods, they're not the most secure. But the heck with them, it's fun. <laughs> if you're thinking about it from an end user that doesn't have any alternative, these often are compelling. Now, the problem is this. They are giving potentially someone keys to the kingdom for that computer remotely. And from an IT director standpoint, we have no clue whether or not that's a good thing. Because if someone has hacked your account and you've got, you know, I mean, it's just one of those where, you know, chain is no stronger than the weakest link. Congratulations, you've just installed a very weak link. To the point there, how many of you guys have heard of PC Anywhere? Anybody still using that? It still exists. It still exists. <laughs> and Symantec begs people to uninstall it. It is that unsecure that they have actually gone out and said, not only do we not support it, we really wish our customer, and I've never heard this. Uh, I can't think of any other software package where the owner, the, the producer of the software package is still in business and just says, don't use this, it's bad, okay? Now, the, the log me in, the go to my PC team viewer, there's pluses and minuses, all good, bads, and difference. But if it's being used in your organization, make sure that it's being used appropriately according to your IT folk. Yes, sir. Yes, IT folk over there. Yeah. The difference between PC Anywhere and the other three is there is no third party PC. It's loaded it up on the software. It's just sitting there waiting for it's spoken to. Is that the issue? Why that's worse than the other three? No. Uh, Symantec actually has said that the, the security holes in PC Anywhere are, are extremely easy to get through, very, very well documented all over the place on the web. They're not easily patched, and they're not going anywhere. So no, this is something where the vendor has said in, in the world of security, this is not even remotely ha-ha a player. 
by the way, just tell that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. I'm port 25. And I'm sorry, what was the address? Leave it wide open <laughs> on your network. So, some questions to ask when you're in this situation is first of all, you need to know what you need. Okay? You remember we talked about applications versus documents? We need to know what is someone, you know, what, why does someone need to do this remote connectivity? What is it that they're looking to do? All right, so what kind of speed do we need? You know, how many users are going to be doing this concurrently? Because again, not only is the, is the internet connection slower than the internal network connection, but the internet connection is being used by everybody connecting to the internet or from the internet for that location. So if you've got a company that only has a T1, which is 1.4 megabits per second, and we've got a lot of people who are downloading those five meg files, because they all want to look at that, eek. It's going to be a problem, it's not going to go away. And it, it truly is, it's a physics thing, you know? You got a 10 pound file and you got a five pound bag, nothing's going anywhere. Okay. What type of connections? Remote desktop, VPN, has a lot to do with the difference. And then how secure do you need? And there's all sorts of ways. I get back to the, the example that I've used many times, uh, the concept of if you live in an apartment building and everybody in the apartment building has the outdoor key and everybody gets an individual key to their apartment and you're standing by the outdoor door and you see a stranger coming up with groceries, you let them in. You know, if you let them in, congratulations, the terrorists win. Because you just let an absolute stranger into the, into the area. You let them through the first line of defense without so much of a question or an issue or anything. If you don't let them in, you're a jerk. I mean, just from a, from a society and from a social nature standpoint. That's, and a company needs to have that discussion of whereabouts in that scale between those two, where are you when we start talking about remote connection? Whichever way you are, and, 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 if, and if the management says, well, we're right in the middle, you give them that kind of look you use for kids when they give you a lame excuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, try again, you know? That's why somebody's got $50 million in diamonds. There you go. I wonder who it is. So, but you have to have, you need to have some kind of conversation. Okay? And then here's the other thing. Migrate. Does your data have to be, or does all your data, we go back here, what a lot of people are doing is they're moving to hosted services or data. And I'll exaggerate a little bit, but let's say I have 20, 20 employees, and those 20 employees are all located at the corporate headquarters. Cool, that makes sense for all the data to be here locally on the local network and all that. Now I start hiring people who are gonna be on the road, 24 by seven. They can be working out of a home office, they can be doing whatever. I hire 40 of them. So now I've got 20 people in the office and 40 people on the outside. So I have twice as many people who might be going after the data that's located locally. It might make sense to start looking at some of the data and some of the applications and moving them to the cloud that's hosted. Because if you host it, their internet pipeline is going to be significantly bigger than anything we can afford. Because they're hosting a whole bunch of people and for a lower cost, probably. Okay, so look, and again, I don't, don't mean to, to look at that as the explicit example, but there's, there's tons of examples like that where you can do types of solutions that, and you can also get where you rent servers out. So it's still your server, it's not a hosted service, it's a hosted server. Your data service, like data service, yeah. Blue Bridge or Exp and whatever that other yeah. one is. Rackspace, uh, any of these guys. Yeah. Okay. What kind of devices? A 
The droid ain't an iPad, ain't an iPhone, ain't a PC, ain't a laptop, ain't a tablet, ain't a whatever. And a machine that you always connect to from home, same computer, same location, you have some more flexibility there than something that's always on the road. You never know where it's connected to. Or if you have a satellite office that five people are going to connect to the local office, you have more options. But for every device that you add, everything increases exponentially. Your problems with your IT. Yeah. Complexity. The more complex something is, the more, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Complex it is. <laughs> right? And one of the things that people get, okay, well, how complicated is it? How many words do you have to use to describe it? That's how complex it is. The more words you have to use to accurately describe it, the more complex. It's that simple. Now, some complexities are going to be more expensive or more prohibitive than others, but by and large, the more you have to explain. Yes, we have 20 mobile devices. They're all iPads. We have 20 mobile devices. Six of them are droids. Four of them are iPads. Eight of them are laptops. And what's that leave? Whatever the remainders are, are you know, increased complexity, increased description. Pretty simple. Does IT need to have some level of control? I don't think That'd just be depressing. <laughs> you guys heard of the BYOD? Bring your own device. Well, this is, you're not even bringing them. You're using your own device from someplace else. Right? You're actually using devices that IT can't even look at and go, don't use that device because they see you using it. You're somewhere else. You know, and in some cases, IT can say, or might be able to say, uh, you can't use that because it's not secure. You can't use that because it doesn't have this level of connectivity or this level of functionality that we need. And in some cases, the IT person has no choice in the matter because it's the, it's the owners. <laughs> Welcome to our world. Absolutely, that's a good point. And in, in most cases, when, and one of the key things is, when you're looking at some of these things is whether they're using the word service. If the more they use the word service, the less control you have over it. All right, and from a legal standpoint, it's very important because it's a service. They are allowing you to host stuff, to put stuff there, but the way that they do it is their business. So, if you take a look at agreements that you have with whether it be Google, I'm pretty sure is this way, Microsoft is this way, and you can actually get, you can, you can get them to, to uh, cut down on some of these things, but it costs more money. They will not guarantee where it's stored. They will not guarantee that they won't move it. They will not guarantee certain levels of access to it. Now think about that. On the surface, oh my God, that's horrible. Because we have no idea where the stuff is. But if you think about it from a management standpoint, if I've got you know, 20,000 companies and their data and I'm trying to manage all of it, if I have servers and I have only a limited number of physical and virtual servers, there's going to be times, whether for load bearing or for maintenance or whatever, I'm going to want to move stuff around in order to keep stuff working. Well, if I have to go and ask every customer, can I do that this weekend? Or, I'm going to do this, I hope you're okay. Instead of being on server SMG0097, we're going to be on SMG0074. Is that okay? All right. Similarly, most companies have, or again, we'll use Google or Microsoft, they have multiple data sites, data centers, for security and all that kind of fun stuff. So from, a, from an operation standpoint, it makes sense. And, let's face it, a lot of this stuff is commodity driven and it's low cost if you go overseas. So, if you have, just because this is the one I'm familiar with, Newbridge, they have petabyte units in Atlanta, in New York, in you know, San Francisco. They have these petabyte units that are plopped around the United States. And 
The one that's like in San Francisco handles Asian traffic. The one in New York handles European traffic. The one in Atlanta pulls in South American traffic. Mm -hmm. But because Blue Bridge does so much work in governments and military and city stuff, don't they have to guarantee those cities, those governments, those military people that their data is protected inside the boundaries, physical boundaries of the United States? First of all, they have to if that's what the contracts say. Okay, now, in the cases that you brought up, I would certainly expect those contracts to say just that. All right, I can't say whether they do or not. But the problem is, is that, okay, you know, Joe's plumbing. <coughs> Joe's Plumbing can either spend 10 bucks per unit of service to have something that will be located in the United States and will be blah, 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 or can spend 50 cents for the exact same service, twice as much storage, and he has no idea where it's going to be stored. Let's go buy, Wal let's go buy tube socks at Walmart. You know, I mean, it's a commodity. It's a commodity. So what kind of accountability is there? Is whatever accountability was in the contract. <laughs> I mean, I hate this. I, I hate to be flip. Actually, no, I love being flip. I'm very good at it. <laughs> but it really does get down to that. These people are providing, and I, and I don't mean this in a derogatory term, these people are providing a service. And part of the service is what is the cost for that service that I can deliver to you? And the more I can do, in, uh, the more I can do for whether it be low-cost commodity units uh, or in terms of my servers aren't as fast or in terms of it's overseas, although too much overseas is a bit of a limit because you know, you've know you got the transmission time and all that. Um, that de if, if, if I do things overseas or like that, de that decreases the cost. But if I'm going to cater to people who deal with HIPAA or SOX or any of that sort of stuff, they, that customer is going to say, no, that's, that security is not a luxury. That's a feature that I have to have. They'll pay more for that, but that's, that's the way that should go. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So really, from the standpoint, it's, it's one of those, you need to have a conversation with the service provider that they are appropriately configured and that they can live up to whatever your requirements are. Or do they have features that you don't really need to pay for, and yeah, we can go with the lower cost and save some money. You know, it's a judgment call, but it's but it's a judgment call that has to be made informed. Okay, and one of the things as far as cloud, when you talk about security for the cloud versus security for local stuff, the question is how well provisioned is it? If it if it's a poorly provisioned, poorly secured local network the cloud security is going to be better. Vice versa, if you're going for an absolute low cost, low commodity, you know, service up in the cloud and you've got a decently regulated, decently controlled uh, network, the local network's going to be better. You know, one size does not fit all, even remotely. But <laughs> oh, it's kind of funny. Once again, thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Yeah. Thank everybody who's online still. <laughs>